and welcome to a presentation on Visual IDE and Visual UI. Uh, Jeff said earlier that it's, it demos well, this sort of product, so I hope I don't prove him wrong. Uh, what I want to start out with is what we're trying to achieve and where we can gain efficiencies. And for that, we need to look at the, the goals of the various life cycles. Uh, the life cycle of a project usually involves planning, markup, specifications, development, testing and polish, and documentation. These are obviously very iterative phases, but uh, it gives us a good starting point to work on. A good user interface designer can help most with the three phases that I've listed here. In the mock-up phase, you're really focusing on speed of development, uh, not the user interface at all. You put in fake buttons in order to simulate complex user, intera uh, complex user interactions. And really what you're trying to do is show a flow, a storyboard, something that people can really have a look at and decide whether you're on the right track. If you're spending too much time on user interface design in this phase, you're wasting your time. It will be thrown out. The designers will come in. You really just want to, to give the sense of what the final product will be. For development, you probably have an artist specification that you have to follow very closely. Uh, you'll get a list of fonts. You'll get a list of colors. You'll get mock-up screenshots, usually from Photoshop, and you need to Follow that as closely as possible. This can take the most time uh, for user interface development. Final polish is probably the worst phase because after it finally gets sent to management, they'll send it back saying, move this icon to the left. We want all the background colors of all user interfaces. Screens change to this. And it's very, very iterative usually in those final stages. So for a user interface design application, there's a few things that it has to do, and it has to do well. The first two there really equate to the mock-up phase. You need to create things quickly. You don't need to remember names of properties. It should all be there as a menu for you, and it should be very, very rapid. From then on, you need to be able to directly implement the artist's vision and the storyboard from the design specifications. You need to be able to fine tune them to match as closely as possible what you've been given. And you also need to see exactly how it will look on the final devices. It's all well and good to get an artist specification for the iPhone, but when you move that over to the Android devices, if it doesn't look good or at least similar, you're going to be doing that process over and over again. You need to look at your user interface independent of application logic. If you're changing the user interface of a screen that is five or six actions deep, debugging that can be quite, quite a challenge. And finally, for the last point, automating repetitive tasks. Uh, an example is my last project. We'd gone through the process. We'd completed all the design. And suddenly on the last day, a manager came in and said, here, I've got another 20 languages. Uh, all translated for you, can you pop them in? In a large application with hundreds of localizable strings, that can be a very time-consuming task to perform. A user interface designer and how to implement it. The points here are that you shouldn't have to worry about object creation and management, separate the user interface from the logic as far as possible, and this is where a big change comes between standard titanium accelerator and alloy. Uh, in the standard SDK, what you need to do is you need to create metadata files that describe your objects and then have the user interface designer fill in that code for you. With alloy, it becomes a lot easier in that the metadata is already there in the XML and the TSS files. Uh, so the great thing about Alloy, certainly in, in this user interface designer, is that you can load in any existing Alloy program, and it will just display in the user interface designer. You don't need any metadata. 
with a standard SDK, metadata needs to be generated and you need to move your user interface objects from unmanaged to managed. And the final one is no matter what you're doing, never kill logic. Uh, whether that logic is saved, unsaved, whatever you're doing in your user interface designer, it should not impact logic on any level. So, our particular user interface designer, we've called Visual UI. It grew out of a, a product called Visual IDE, which was a standalone executable, which we compiled for Windows, Macintosh, Linux. But then we decided it would be a lot easier if it just lived inside Titanium Studio. So we rewrote it as a plugin. It consists of three main views, the host object view, the properties view, and the log. Then it has the editor, internal editor, called the scratch pad. And then it uses the external designers so you can view your final UI on the various target mobile devices. It works on all Titanium Studio supported platforms and obviously handles all Titanium Studio target devices. Final point there is that you can either decide to launch your project in standard SDK form or as an Alloy project. So I'm going to go through the, the primary views here quickly and then I'll follow up with a demonstration. Host object view. As you can see, it's a tree view that just lists the hierarchy of your objects. So you, uh, <clears throat> as you can see, you have your application, uh, has a child of the tabs, which has a child of the windows, and then the, the children of the individual objects attached to that window. This view handles all the heavy lifting, loading, saving, internationalization, and loading all the internal and external designers as need be. Uh, when you right click on anything, you can move objects, copy them, create them, and so on. Then there's the property view. When a particular user interface object is selected in the object hosts view, uh, every single property that can possibly be set for that object is listed here. There's various editors, so for example, when you click on a, a color property, you will get the color wheel, and so on. Uh, at the top, this is quite interesting, are the hints for the object creation. In this particular example, it's a standard SDK file, so for example, a window needs to know whether it's part of a tab or not, and their startup says, should I be created when my parent is created? In an alloy project, obviously, it's a bit different in that you would set which particular devices this object is allowed to appear on, its class, its ID, and so on. The properties view is also very concerned with how you interact with your user interface. So that top left button there changes depending. If you're in a standard SDK environment, it'll tell you which particular mobile device you're working towards, uh, iPhone, iPad, Android, tablet, and so on. If you're an alloy, it changes in that <clears throat> you can view which theme that you, you're working on at that time. Uh, the other buttons decide how you handle drag for move and drag for resize on the internal and external designers. Do you want DPI? Do you want percentage? Do you want pixels? Scratchpad's an internal designer. And really, what it does is it gives us a rough idea of what our final user interface will look like. It's not pixel perfect. It won't exactly match what the actual end device will be. But it gives you a rough idea and a handy interface to interact with those particular objects. You'll see at the top, there's low a row of icons, those are the different objects that you can create. You click and you drag them on to the designer. You can then select the objects, uh, implement callbacks for the various items. And yeah, you'll also notice that uh, you can flip between which target you're looking at. 
iPhone, Android, tablet, and for those uh, the various resolutions of the final target devices and their associated DPIs. When you're getting closer, you then flip over to the external designers, which are the actual simulators uh, for the, the target devices, so you can see exactly what your user interface will look like on those individual targeted platforms. Again, only display the user interface. Don't worry about logic. Whatever you've selected on your host object's view, we'll make sure that that particular object is viewed on the final device. You can have all these designers open at the same time if you're targeting all of them at the same time. Uh, for this, it's just a, a simple little application that accepts the streaming of the object creation, the images, and so on to that device. On to the live demonstration. So, Visual UI is installed the way you would expect it to be. Ah, if I had the network. <laughs> you just pop in the appropriate URL there and select, and it'll install for you. Sorry, the resolution here isn't exactly <laughs> what I was expecting. So you can create a new project. You can create a titanium project. And what you can do is you can either create a visual UI template application. And what that does really is in your files creates those comment blocks which provides the metadata for the object creation. Uh, that's obviously very important because in the standard SDK we have no way of, of separating that out of the file. Uh, or you can create an alloy project, which Visual UI handles natively as well. So I'll start off with Visual UI. Visual IDE, you just, to show it initially, you go to Window, Show View, Other, and you can add the Visual UI Host Objects window. You can turn on the other windows, but uh, they'll also be opened automatically as you load a project into Visual UI. So here I'm going to load the project into Visual UI. And as the same, my resolution isn't great, but you can get a general idea for what we're looking at. So what you can then do is what you'd expect to be able to do, drag and drop as necessary onto your visual internal designer. You can also have a look at how it would look in Android and have a look at the the various resolutions. As you can see here on the right, for every object in this case, the top button is selected. Everything that you can set for a button is listed here. You can click to select, and in this case, I'll just quickly change the background color of the window. And there you can see it. So if we save this and open that JavaScript file, as you can see, what it's done is it's created that user interface for you in these commented off blocks. You'll see here is the metadata that is necessary to create those individual objects and then the code falls below it. 
what you can also do is create functions. Uh, and it will fill in that callback for you and take you to it. So here, So if you have a look here, you can also view it in your external designer. We have sites to load. One thing is obviously that does not look right. I need to find out my internal IP address. I apologize. Ah. OK, so this is exactly how it will look on the final target device. Uh, and it looks very close to what we saw in the scratch pad with a few differences. as you can see there. Now, as you recall, we added a little alert to the second button. So if you want to test the user interface, you can obviously just run it as per normal through the standard. OK. Uh, what we can also do under visual UI is obviously automate our internationalization. This works on both uh, Alloy and standard SDK projects. Uh, what it does is it takes the strings out of the managed objects or straight out of the Alloy TSS files, pops them into the appropriate internationalization file, allows you to export, import new languages, and so on. Uh, you can set fonts, global variables. What you can do here is you can have certain variables, such as uh, login name, set that as a globally accessible variable, and set whether it is loaded and stored uh, as appropriate, loaded on startup, saved whenever you want it to, and being persistent, or strings such as base URLs and so on. So if you don't mind, I'll quickly show you the Alloy project. Cloud will probably fail again. As you can see here, an alloy system looks a bit different. In that, what we do is we have a direct look at the XML files and the TSS files as they exist. So in this case, index.xml has been created. Uh, and Visual UI will read that in. It'll handle all the, the other extra bits, such as the, the require links and, and so on. And as you can see here, in the creation hints, you can set your platform, your form factor, your class, and your ID, as well as all the other properties that you'd expect to be able to set for that particular item. For, for Alloy, as I mentioned, no extra, no extra metadata is needed. We can just load it directly. 
So if you've added any of your own personal uh, custom data into the XML file, that won't be overwritten. It'll carry on as per normal. And for the properties, what you're looking at here are the IDs for, for the actual XML. If you want to work on the TSS, you can create your, <coughs> your individual items. So for example, you can set your ID, you can set your class, and just by control clicking, clicking you can then add your, your individual class IDs uh, and themes and what have you directly onto the source file. You can also view the TSS files directly and edit them as you see fit. And one other thing uh, that will soon be coming to Visual UI that was in Visual IDE, uh, certainly my designers quite liked the uh, XRB uh, user interface creation in uh, Xcode for the iPhone. So what we've done is we've written a converter that takes the, the XRB files and converts them directly into Alloy or mobile SDK code. And I think that is it. Thank you very much for listening. And are there any questions? Yes, yes. Of, let, me, let me give you an example of that. Okay, so it depends whether you want to drag and drop or not. Uh, so for example, if you want to create a table view, Then add a search bar to that. As you can see, in the hierarchy there, you have the table and the search bar. So for a window, in theory, you would have a view and then, uh, or a scroll view. You would, if you dragged and dropped into that particular target area, it would appear there. Or you can just command click on one of these items and uh, do a quick create of a, a sub item for that. Uh, so the, it, it really is all about the hierarchy. You need to, to have the hierarchy right. If, for example, you drag and drop and you're off by a pixel or two, you can also just drag and drop on the host objects view and move it between views or copy it and paste it to another view. Yes. Is the, the same uh, possibility is true for iPhone with iPhone 5 and iPhone 4? Yes, uh, for, for iPhone. Obviously, there's the iPhone and the, the iPhone 5. Um, so I've, I've put in as many of those as I can. What you have to remember, though, that this is, as I said, it's called the scratch pad for a reason. It's not pixel perfect. It's really to just give you a good sense of, of what your final application will look like. You really have to go into the emulators to truly see what the finished product will be. Uh, at, <laughs> uh, at the moment, I've got a 30-day a, a trial. Uh, I've set the price at uh, $30 a year in the marketplace. Uh, though we have been quite generous of people. Drop us an email and ask for another six months. We haven't been averse to that. Any more questions for Grant? Uh, 
I, I haven't really used Forged UI. Um, from what I have heard is that uh, what it does is it creates the user interface in separate files, which you then have to move into your source code. And it also doesn't handle native alloy, from what I understand. Uh, really, the whole thing of Visual UI was that the user interface shouldn't get in the way of your development. You should be able to hit save and not have to move anything. It should just work. And, and really, that's what we've been after. I, I can't really comment on Forged, but, uh, and I'm sure it's a great product. But uh, I think we were going after different markets. We still have about five or 10 minutes. If there's some other demos that you can show, perhaps? Uh, such as? <laughs> uh, any, anything. Uh, let's see. Obviously, whatever you want to add. Uh, uh, an interesting one is the, the Facebook button. Uh, again, that was just a little time saver. For the global variables, all you need to do is set, set up your app ID and your permissions. It'll update the XML directly uh, in, your, in your main XML file and uh, just work. Obviously, you have your, all your options there. Uh, Ah, another interesting thing is forms. Uh, because rarely in the standard SDK these particular <coughs> items are managed, uh, what we did is we were finding that forms were quite onerous to put together. Uh, you have your standard forms, please enter your country, please enter your age, date of birth, all that sort of thing. So what we did is we encapsulated it into a, a single button, and then you can add your questions directly. Let me see if I can show you. So what happens here is it will it'll create a form. It'll import the appropriate JavaScript. Uh, it's loosely based off the example form code that uh, is on the Accelerator site. And this just shows you what a good user interface designer can do, is that it can really just hide the complexity of setting up the form. You tell it whether the questions come from a, a stored location or if it's new each time. If it's from a stored location, should it save it back to that location as the form is filled in? And it can really just make you more efficient when designing these particular things. So for example, for question type, you can set text, email, date, number, password, phone, picker, checkbox, switch, submit button, country. And really, if you've written it once, why do you need to write it many, many times? And if you have written a good library that does all of this for you, do you really need to remember which files you need to include, what the name of the creation function is, and so on? If it's something you're going to be doing more than once, we should have a very quick way of doing it without you needing to remember all the input variables that you'll, you'll need to have. Uh, here, you can obviously flip between these things. Uh, let me just go into the designer again. One thing that can be tricky in a drag and drop designer situation like this is uh, scroll views with vertical layout. Obviously, when you have scroll views with vertical layout, drag and drop doesn't make a lot of sense for drag to move and drag to resize. So what we have to do is for these things uh, really disable Disable the dragging. And also, if your view is too big uh, to fit on an individual screen, if you've got these anchors available, uh, you won't be able to see what's at the bottom because you'll be trying to move the object as opposed to, to viewing them. 
So you can just click that off over there. Okay. Anything Any else? final questions? No? Can everyone thank Grant for putting together uh, this presentation? Thank you.